Ancient Faith Radio and Monacos.net presents A Word from the Holy Fathers with Deacon Matthew Steenberg. This podcast provides a weekly reflection on the writings of the Church Fathers, their significance, and their insights for the life of Orthodox Christians in every age. Father Deacon Matthew is Professor and the Head of Theology and Religious Studies at Leeds Trinity in England, as well as a Deacon in the Russian Orthodox Church in the United Kingdom. Here is Father Matthew. Over the course of this and the next few weeks, I would like us to focus in an extended way on passages from a homily by our Father among the Saints, Basil the Great of Caesarea. This Saint Basil, known as one of the three Cappadocian Fathers, and beloved by many as one of the greatest theologians in the history of the Church, has left a legacy of many homilies, many texts bearing his name. But there is one homily that stands out to me as of particularly significant value, and this is his homily on the words, Be attentive to yourself, found in the book of Deuteronomy. This text is so powerful and so significant that it does not seem fitting simply to extract one bit or another, as if that was the full wisdom of the sermon as a whole. So what I would like to do is take a little bit today, a little bit next week, and a little bit in the week that follows, looking at the robust way in which St. Basil deals with this important commandment found in this book of Moses. At the beginning of the homily on the words, Be attentive to yourself, St. Basil reminds his hearers, and let us remember this is a homily, it would have been delivered in the context of the divine services in the holy temple. St. Basil begins his homily by reminding his listeners, his hearers, that God gives us language so that we can hear and discern his will, and so that we then can reflect upon it and learn from it. In St. Basil's words, God who has created us has given us the use of language that we may reveal the plans of our heart to each other and through our shared nature may give each a share to our neighbor as if from some treasury, showing forth our intentions from what lies hidden in our heart. For indeed, he says a bit later, the excellence proper to discourse is neither to hide the things signified in obscurity nor to be redundant and empty, turning in all directions, while overflowing randomly. This practical introduction is the way he moves into his reflection on the text in Deuteronomy. God has given us words, given us language, so that we can reflect neither superfluously nor in an empty way, but in a manner that discloses the hidden depths of things, the full reality of God's revelation. It is after he has said this that St. Basil comes to reflect on the reading from Deuteronomy. As he writes, What we have just read from the books of Moses is truly of such a kind, which all of you who are diligent have remembered, unless possibly through brevity it has escaped your notice. The reading is as follows. Be attentive to yourself, lest an unlawful word come to be hidden in your heart that is, Deuteronomy chapter 15, verse 9. St. Basil continues, We human beings are easily led towards sins of the mind. Therefore, he who has formed our hearts individually, knowing that the greatest part of sin is accomplished in impulse through what is in our intention, has prescribed purity in our directive faculty as primary for us. For that by which we most readily sin is worthy of the most guarding and care. For as the physicians with greater foresight safeguard the weaker parts of the bodies by precautionary advice ahead of time, so the universal protector and true physician of souls, who knows most of all where we are more liable to slide towards sin, has anticipated this with stronger guarding. For actions done through the body need time and opportunity, and labors and co-workers and other requirements. But the movements of the mind operate timelessly. They are completed without weariness, 
are constructed effortlessly and are convenient on every occasion. Perhaps someone haughty who looks down on propriety, though clothed in the outward appearance of sobriety, and sitting among many who call him blessed for his virtue, has run away in his mind to the place of sin in a hidden movement of his heart. He sees in his imagination the things that he seeks. He again imprints there some indecent liaison, and entirely within the secret workshop of the heart he paints a clear picture of the pleasure for himself. He has accomplished the sin inwardly. It is without witness, unknown to all, until there comes the revelation of the hidden things of darkness and the disclosure of the intentions of hearts. Therefore, brethren, be on guard, lest at any time there come a lawless hidden word in your heart. St. Basil, commenting on this passage in Deuteronomy, reveals something important and insightful about the human condition. When we sin with the body, the sin of our senses, the sins of our physical members, that sin requires activities and actions. Things are done outwardly. They can be seen. It takes time to perform certain sins. It takes an exercise of will that manifests itself before others. But sins which reside in the heart, in the mind, sins of attention, sins of wish and desire and lust, these St. Basil identifies as taking no time. We can accomplish them deftly in an instant, and they are hidden deep within because they are not linked directly to our physical bodies, these impulses of the mind and of the heart can be carried out and brought to fruition with no external evidence. We can sit in the midst of holy people and commit great sins within us, of which the outside world remains utterly unaware, until, as St. Basil reminds in that passage, that coming day when the sins of all shall be disclosed. St. Basil has here identified two different types or categories of sinful activity, the outward sins of the body and the interior sins of the mind. And, he says, just as a doctor identifies certain areas which are more prone to easy infection, to easy disease, and preventatively stops them from becoming infected, so the Holy Scriptures, here in the books of Moses, prevent us from infection, from spiritual disease, in that aspect of our sinning which is the most simple, the most readily available, that is, the sin of the mind, the sin of the heart. Be attentive to yourself, is what Moses has written. And St. Basil emphasizes that he gives this wisdom, this directive, so that we can pay attention to that mind, that heart, in which it is so easy to sin. This is not to say we are not also to be attentive to the body. Of course we are. But in the heart, where sins can be accomplished so swiftly, so easily, in that realm there is need for extra attentiveness, be attentive to yourself. St. Basil then continues. Each of the animals by nature has from God who has constructed all things the resources to God its own structure. And you would find, if you observed carefully, that most of the non-rational animals have without training an aversion to what is harmful, and again by a certain natural attraction they hasten toward the enjoyment of beneficial things. Therefore also God who is educating us has given us this great precept, that as this comes to them by nature, it comes to us by help of reason. And as they are set aright without reflection, we may accomplish this through the attentive and continuous care of thoughts. And guarding strictly the resources given us by God, let us flee sin as the non-rational animals flee harmful foods, but pursue justice as they pursue nourishing grass. So, brethren, be attentive to yourself, that you may be able to distinguish what is harmful from what is healthful. 
attentiveness is of two kinds. On the one hand, we can gaze intently with the bodily eyes at visible things, and on the other hand, by its noetic faculty, the soul can apply itself to the contemplation of incorporeal things. Here St. Basil has gone further, and by drawing the example of the non-rational beasts of the animal kingdom, has shown the way the impulses work within us. There is an instinct in animals, but a rational faculty in the human creature. It is within our noetic faculties, as he calls them, that we are able to discern right from wrong, good from bad, not simply as a physical or emotional impulse, but as a reasoned deliberation reflecting the freedom and the will of God our fashioner. What is necessary, then, is that we guard this faculty intently and carefully, that we learn to gaze within the mind, to see there the impulses that lead us aright and those which lead us astray. If we do not practice within ourselves this attentiveness, this discernment, this constant watching, then we will be ruled, like the irrational beasts, by the simple impulses of soul and body. We will be guided by the compulsions of our passions. And yet there awaits for us the opportunity at every moment to do as Moses says, to look within the mind, within the heart, and be attentive to ourselves. This advice, fleshed out by St. Basil, gives us a practical foundation for our Christian struggle. We are to embrace the faculties given us by the Lord and exercise them well and truthfully in our hearts and minds, and thus may we make progress day by day in attaining to his kingdom. I've read today from the first two sections of St. Basil's homily on the words, Be attentive to yourself. Next week we shall carry on with his continuing reflections on this important theme. This week we return to St. Basil of Caesarea's homily on the words, Be attentive to yourself, drawn from the book of Deuteronomy. Last week we looked at the first two sections of this important homily, in which St. Basil identified the mind and the heart as the seat of interior sin, the place where sin is possible deftly and swiftly in an interiorized, secret way, and for this reason the very place where our mind must dwell, where the noose gazes upon itself to keep it from harm, so that we can freely choose the right from the wrong, unlike irrational beasts which simply make their decisions by impulse. In the next section of his letter, St. Basil brings this directly to bear in practical terms. Be attentive then to yourself, he says, that is, neither to what is yours, nor to what is around you, but be attentive only to you yourself. For we ourselves are one thing, but what is ours is another, and the things around us are yet another still. Thus we are the soul and the mind, through which we have come into being according to the image of the Creator. But the body is ours, and the sense perceptions through it, while around us are possessions, skills, and the other equipment of life. What then does the divine word say? Do not be attentive to the flesh, nor pursue its good in every manner, health, beauty, enjoyment of pleasures, and long life nor admire wealth and reputation and power. As for those things that are of service to you in this temporary life, do not regard them as great. Through concern about these things, do not neglect the life that comes first for you, but be attentive to yourself, that is, to your soul. Adorn it, take care of it, so that all the filth befalling it from wickedness may be removed through attention and all the shame due to evil may be cleansed away. Adorn it and brighten it with all the beauty that comes from virtue. Examine what sort of being you are. Know your own nature, that your body is mortal, yet your soul immortal, and that our life is twofold in kind, 
One is proper to the flesh, quickly passing by, while the other is akin to the soul, not admitting of circumscription. So be attentive to yourself, neither remaining in mortal things as if they were eternal, nor despising eternal things as if they were passing away. Look down on the base flesh, for it is passing. Take care of the soul, for it is something immortal. Understand yourself with all exactness, so that you may know what gift to apportion to each, for the flesh nourishment and coverings, and for the soul doctrines of piety, education in courtesy, training in virtue, correction of the passions. This is a remarkable text in which St. Basil continues to disclose the deep meaning of Moses' words. Here he identifies the true nature of the human person, being of soul and mind in body. It might be easy, on first reading, to take this passage to in some ways denigrate the bodily nature of the human person. St. Basil seems to be saying that our real attention ought to be simply on the soul and not on the body. The body is mortal and passing away, whereas the soul is eternal etc. Yet St. Basil here is not speaking of our bodily nature writ large. He clearly says that we are to care for the body, for it is a gift of God, that we are to nourish it. He goes on a little later in the section to say that we must feed it, but not too much. We must look after it, but not with a kind of passionate desire. The body is clearly something holy given to us by God. Yet in this life, where our sin is so much manifested through the body, we can, in the perversion of our fallenness, use the body to our detriment. We can use it as a thing which binds us to the temporal, corrupt reality of this life. And that use of the body is of hindrance to the attainment of the kingdom. If we are trapped in the body's mortality, if we become trapped in the physical nature of this world, then we do not use our soul aright. We do not look after that eternal reality within us. It is not that the body is bad, but that the body, in its sinful reality, keeps our attention away from the soul and the heart. This is the distinction often drawn in the Scripture and Fathers between body and flesh. The body is the natural reality in man. Flesh is the word used to describe it in its fallen dimensions. In all this, St. Basil discloses a dimension of the command, Be attentive to yourself. We have heard him stress in so many ways that one must know one's real nature. To be attentive to oneself is to see oneself for what one really is that we are body and yet also soul, that we must, yes, look after the physical needs of our body. But most people in the world do this naturally. To know oneself truly is to know that we are also eternal soul, that we have within us the eternal life given by God. And how often do we really look after that? Be attentive to yourself, says St. Basil, know who you really are, for in this way we are able to identify both where we are going astray, but also, significantly, where we can change so as to become that which God wants us to be. To come to a knowledge of the self is an important aspect of the Christian life as St. Basil discloses it. This is not some secret esoteric knowledge such as we might find in Gnostic traditions or the kind of inner self-knowledge that we hear about in New Age movements with some regularity. St. Basil is being utterly practical. If we wish to make advance in the spiritual life, we must know who we are. We are creatures of body, but creatures also of soul, of mind, of heart. When we know who we are, when we are genuinely attentive to ourselves, we come to see how imbalanced is our normal day-to-day -day life, 
how much more attention we pay towards satisfying bodily pleasures, physical needs, and how little, if at all, we conscientiously observe that eternal dimension within us and learn to purify it and exercise it to the attainment of the kingdom of God. Be attentive to yourself. This is St. Basil's command, echoing that of Moses the God-seer. For in being attentive to our true selves, we come to see the icons of Christ that we have been fashioned to be. We shall carry on again next week with a third section from St. Basil's homily. In this third and final broadcast in which we focus on this important text, I would like to look at a few of the closing remarks made by this great father with respect to this passage. Towards the end of what was quite a lengthy homily, in fact, St. Basil says the following, If you are attentive to yourself, you will discover these things about yourself and still more, and you will enjoy the things present and will not be downcast about what you lack. This precept will be a great help if you are mindful of it on all occasions. For instance, has anger gained mastery over your thoughts, and have you been carried away by temper towards inappropriate words and savage, beast-like actions? If you were attentive to yourself, you would curb your temper like some disobedient and refractory colt, striking it with a blow of reason as if by a lash. You would also control your tongue, and you would not lay hands on the one provoking you. Again, evil desires madden the soul, casting you into incontinent and licentious impulses. If you were attentive to yourself, and remembered that for you this present enjoyment will result in bitterness in the end, and this tickling which through pleasure has now come about in your body will in the end bring forth the venomous worm punishing us for ever in hell, and the burning of the flesh will become mother of eternal fire. Immediately the pleasure would be gone and banished. A certain wondrous interior calm and a quiet in the soul will also come into being, as when the noise of undisciplined servant girls becomes silent through the entrance of a discreet lady. Therefore be attentive to yourself, and know that the rational part of the soul is also intelligent, but that the passionate part is irrational. The one who exists by nature to rule, while the other exists to obey reason and to be persuaded by it. So do not ever allow your mind, reduced to utter slavery, to become a slave of the passions. Moreover, do not yield to the passions struggling against reason, and let them transfer to themselves the rule of the soul. Here St. Basil has gone further than in the passages we have read in our previous broadcasts. In those passages he identified attentiveness to the soul as the necessary preventative medicine for that aspect of our humanity in which it is so easy to sin, the mind and the heart. And then we saw how St. Basil used this to chase out the differing dimensions of our created being, body, soul, and mind. Here, St. Basil has gone on to say that by a right exercise of attentiveness to our heart, to our mind, to ourselves, by this right exercise of attentiveness, we will find solace in life. In technical terms, we will find through this attentiveness the tools by which to defeat the passions. Some passions, or rather some of the tools used to combat the passions, are of the practical, arrow-like sort. There is a passion, and then there is a tool used to defeat it specifically. So, if we are, for example, undergoing a specific passionate experience, one tool might be the practice of many prostrations, or of fasting, or of saying a specific prayer, or undergoing some other action prescribed by a spiritual father. These are tools which respond to the provocation of the passions and attack them like an arrow shot out of a sling to defeat the raging enemy. 
But there is another kind of tool used to prevent the passions from arising in the first place, and it is of this type of tool that St. Basil has here spoken. Attentiveness to the true nature of ourselves keeps us alert to the reality which the passions are provoking. If we are inattentive to ourselves, when the passions provoke us towards lust, towards some ignoble desire or beast-like action, as St. Basil calls it, if we are inattentive to ourselves, it is all too easy to succumb to such impulses. But if we are constantly exercising this interior attentiveness, we will see the provocation for what it really is. We will see the actual end of this temporal desire, something which may tickle the flesh or the mind now, as he puts it, but which in the end leads us only to disaster, only to despair. An attentiveness to ourself, an attentiveness to our minds and hearts, keeps us aware so that the passions are not given entry into our heart, into our mind, into our body. This is the preventative medicine of the ascetical life. Be attentive to yourself and give the passions no room, no entry. This is St. Basil's extrapolation of Christ's command, Go and sin no more. How are we to know whether we are about to sin or not, unless we foster in ourselves that which Moses commanded, attentiveness to our innermost being? St. Basil goes on to offer another great insight about what is brought about through such attentiveness. Reading from a little later in the seventh section of his homily, the exact comprehension of yourself, he says, also provides sufficient guidance towards the concept of God. For if you are attentive to yourself, you will not need to trace your understanding of the fashioner from the structure of the universe, but in yourself, as if in a kind of small ordered world, you will see the great wisdom of the Creator. Understand that God is incorporeal from the incorporeal soul that exists in you, which is not circumscribed by place. Since neither as a matter of principle does your mind spend its life in a place, but through its conjunction with the body it comes to be in a place. You will believe God to be invisible in understanding your own soul, since it also is ungraspable with bodily eyes, for it is colorless, without shape, it has not been encompassed by any bodily characteristic, but it is recognized only from its energies. Nor should you investigate God by understanding through the eyes, but supporting faith by reason, have spiritual understanding of Him. Marvel at the Creator's work, how the power of your own soul has been bound together with the body, so that penetrating to its extremities it leads the many separate limbs and organs to one convergence and sharing of life. Examine what power from the soul is given to the flesh, what sympathy is given back to the soul by the flesh, how the body receives life from the soul and the soul receives pain from the body. St. Basil carries on with further descriptions throughout this passage. But is this not a remarkable testimony to the Creator's great design? If we are truly attentive to ourselves, St. Basil says, then we find not only an awareness of who we are, but through ourselves, through this creation that God has fashioned, we learn about God Himself. It takes no great science to understand and to know God. We do not have, says St. Basil, to work our way up to divine knowledge by analyzing this and that aspect of creation, and so coming to a greater understanding. We are, as he says, a little world in ourselves, a microcosm, to use the term we most often associate with St. Maximus the Confessor. And in this little creation, this little world of our own being, we discover the testimony of God's life. We see God who is incorporeal as we have a corporeal soul. 
we see him who is infinite and limitless in the own infinite limitless nature of the human soul. We see a God who is incarnate by the very symphony and harmony of our soul and body. So attentiveness to ourselves is not simply a way out of the passions, is not simply a way out of sin, it is also a way into a true contemplation with our Creator and our Maker. So be attentive to yourselves. A little later in the final section of the text, St. Basil has this to say. If you like, brethren, after your contemplation of the soul, be attentive also to the structure of your body. Marvel at how appropriate a dwelling for the rational soul the sovereign fashioner has created it to be. He has made the human being alone of all animals upright, that from your very form you may see that your life is akin on high. For all the quadrupeds are bent down toward their stomachs, while the human being is prepared to look up towards heaven so as not to be devoted to the stomach or to the passions below it, but to direct his whole desire to the journey on high. And God has placed his head at the top, locating it in the most valuable of the senses. There sight and hearing and taste and smell have been established all near to one another, and although confined in the small space, none of them impedes the activity of its neighbor. The eyes have not laid hold of the highest lookout point so that nothing blocks their view of the body's parts, but placed under the small projection of the brow, they reach out from the prominence above in a direct line. Again, hearing is not directed straight, but by a spiral-shaped pathway it takes hold of the noises in the air. This indeed exhibits the highest wisdom, enabling sound to pass through unhindered, or rather to be led in, bending around the twists, while nothing from outside that accidentally falls can be a hindrance to the auditory perception. Examine closely, too, the nature of the tongue, how it is tender and nimble, and is sufficient by its varied movement for every need of speech. Teeth, which are also organs of speech, provide strong resistance to the tongue, and at the same time also take care of food, some cutting it, others grinding it. And so when you have traversed all things with suitable reflection on each, when you have observed carefully how air is drawn down through the breath, how warmth is kept around the heart and the organs of digestion and the channels of blood, from all these you will perceive the unsearchable wisdom of the Creator. So you will also say to him with the prophet, Thy knowledge from myself has become wonderful. Therefore be attentive to yourself, that you may be attentive to God, to whom be glory and dominion, and to the ages of ages. Amen. Through the prayers of our Holy Father, Basil the Great of Caesarea and of all the saints, Lord Jesus Christ our God, have mercy upon us and save us. Amen. A Word from the Holy Fathers is a joint production of Ancient Faith Radio and Monacos.net. Monacos.net exists to further the study of Orthodox Christianity through reflection on its patristic, monastic, liturgical, and ecclesiastical heritage. Join Deacon Matthew each week for another Word from the Holy Fathers.